Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. We are here uh, for part two of the City Nature Challenge live discussion. And uh, tonight we're gonna be looking uh, predominantly at plants, fungi, and other things that don't move uh, in southeastern Michigan uh, to try to identify those observations for the City Nature Challenge. Uh, my name is Jade and I'm the Science Communication Manager for the Museum of Natural History. Uh, I helped organize this with a bunch of fantastic folks uh, who know a lot more about these things than I do. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to remind folks of some helpful uh, kind of ground rules. Uh, if you are not speaking, it would be really helpful if you could uh, mute your microphone. And if you haven't already, go ahead and log into the iNaturalist website. That way you can do screen sharing and share your observations with us. Uh, if you'd prefer not to do that, it's not a problem. Just feel free to post a link in the chat window to anything you want us to look at, and one of the moderators will pull it up on their screen instead. Uh, if you'd like to comment or ask a question, um, posting in the chat window is uh, a good way to do that so that we don't end up talking over one another. And if you prefer for a moderator to read your question instead, you can type it out completely and we'll address it as soon as we see it. Uh, and of course, this is a, a virtual event that will be shared on our Museum at Home webpage. Uh, we want to give folks who weren't able to attend a chance to see what's going on, so only share what you're comfortable sharing. This is uh, a great time to turn on or off your webcam, depending on what you're comfortable with. And uh, also, please remember to use friend, uh, family friendly language so we can share this with the rest of our uh, friends. As I mentioned uh, before, this is all organized uh, in celebration of the City Nature Challenge, which was going on uh, April 24th through 27th. That was the first stage. So this is uh, an annual event where cities around the world make observations of animals, plants, and other wildlife um, found in their area or their city. And then it gets identified and becomes part of a kind of a larger uh, database. And we're actually in part two of this whole process. So we're going to be identifying all the wonderful things that got found uh, and observed during part one. Um, Kit, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. So, uh, as I, yeah, we have uh, actually observed a lot of critters around uh, Washtenaw County, uh, and we are actually at a hundred, or excuse me, 1,529 observations, uh, about half of which still need identification. Uh, and of those observations, uh, almost 500 species have been identified. And uh, as Kit pointed out yesterday, those are still rolling in as folks upload photos and um, upload observations from last weekend, those numbers are going to continue to rise. So we have uh, a few folks uh, joining us tonight uh, that are going to be helping with identification. Um, I, I do not, I don't think Randy is actually going to be, to be here this evening. Uh, he was here yesterday for the animals and other things that move session. So um, Kit and Maya, do you want to introduce yourselves real quick? Why don't you go ahead and start, Maya? All righty, I will go ahead and do that. Hello, everyone. My name is Maya. I am the Independent Volunteer Coordinator with the City of Ann Arbor's Natural Area Preservation, and I've also been a part of making City Nature Challenge Ann Arbor happen this year. It's been a really exciting time. Um, the City Nature Challenge is fantastic because it really helps achieve Natural Area Preservation's mission, which is one, to protect and restore Ann Arbor's natural areas, and also to help foster an environmental ethic amongst its citizens. So this citizen science engagement is a really exciting thing that we were super excited to get involved in this year. 
Um, and I would also like to just say thank you to the global organizers. This challenge started with the California Academy of Sciences and also the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And they are the ones who do the global organization part of this whole thing. We're local organizations here in Michigan doing just the local project. So looking at the local data is really awesome and cool. And then on May the 4th, I encourage everyone to go to the global website page, so citynaturechallenge.org, and see how the whole earth did this year in terms of what we found and who had the most observations. So thank you to them and also to everyone here participating this evening. Cool, thank you, Maya. Uh, my name is Kit Howard. I am uh, sort of an independent hanger on helping to uh, organize the event. Um, locally, I'm a master rain gardener and uh, have done um, about 30 years of um, flower photography, but only really got into the identification, um, seriously identification, uh, maybe a couple of years ago when, um, when I discovered INAT, which has become my newest obsession. Uh, I want to, um, to echo Maya's words around uh, my love of seeing citizen science really grow and prosper and think that even with uh, COVID uh, doing its worst, we have managed to pull this off as, as the time went by from the moment that we first started this to things beginning to look a little bit dicey to things going pear-shaped. Um, at each stage, we were able to sort of stop and turn and go off in another direction and figure out new ways of doing it and, you know, come up with another approach. And uh, so it's been really neat that the event has been uh, flexible enough to allow us to do that. So I'm, I'm super thrilled with um, the level of observations we have. To give you a sense, last year, I think we had seven people registered to participate in the, the project. And I think we got to a grand total of 310 observations. So we pretty much blown that out of the water this year. So, um, so I'm, I'm really, really pleased. And thanks to everybody who has helped uh, put this together. So I think that's it. Great. And uh, speaking of citizen science, we're, we're also joined by Justin Schell of the Shapiro Design Lab, who is the uh, citizen and community science uh, aficionado who has been uh, helping the museum um, co-organize these events. So. Uh, so does anyone have any iNaturalist observations that they uh, would like to share either with their screen or in the chat window so we can start uh, identifying some stuff and getting some more uh, information to support these observations? What did you see that was really exciting or maybe that you weren't 100% sure of the idea? If you don't, um, if you don't have it up, um, we can, I've got a screen open with um, uh, the filter page on it and you can just give me your user ID for INAT um, if you uploaded your um, observations into INAT. And uh, we can pull them up that way too, if um, if you're not sure quite which one is where, or or are not comfortable um, sharing yourself. I can also um, start just to get the conversation going. Go ahead, are you bringing are you bringing one up, Jade? Because I have one or two yeah. here that I have up too. So good, excellent. Aha. So I found this little um, violet. Uh, it's in the the same. It's a violet, I guess, or a, a wild pansy, as they're um, identifying it in my neighbor's yard, <laughs> and. I was really struck by the fact that these, the same plant was bearing flowers that were all different colors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know there are a lot of wild violet species in this area, 
Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering if anybody knows, um, A, is this the correct identification? And, and B, what causes those, um, those color differences? I can take the easy answer out on the color differences. It's probably genetic, but that's a that's an easy flip answer. Um, I've seen these multicolored ones as well. Um, we can have a look up. Actually, you know what? If you click on to the right of your screen where it says wild pansy, you should bring up yes the um, the page that has, oh, it just took you back to you. There you go, yeah, on that one. And we can look at a whole bunch of um, of photographs that, that INAT has said, or that, let me rephrase that, that people using INAT have uploaded to INAT and identified as wild pansy. We have to remember that these, um, these photos are, are just lightly curated. They're community curated. So um, it's always a really good idea to look at lots and lots of photos whenever you're using INAT to identify things. Um, because as you can see from what's coming up, we're seeing quite a bit of variability here. I mean, some of them, like the ones on the upper right, are definitely three colors right there. Um, but some of them are just, um, you know, white with a bit of a, yes, that one. So we've clearly got three colors there, perhaps even more with, um, that nice little uh, smudge at the bottom. But toward the left there, we're seeing something that's much more just yellow, maybe pale yellow, white, and, uh, and the stripes. So, you know, INAT folks have identified all of these as wild violet. Um, my usual next step, unless I'm pretty comfortable, is uh, to pop up um, a guide of some sort and just double check that, yeah, in fact, somebody who's, who's uh, good enough to have published anyway um, really agrees that this is, in fact, wild violet. To your point, Jade, if you go down to um, the Nan Weston Preserve uh, down in Sharon Hollow, uh, it's owned by the Nature Conservancy. And I personally have found at least 12 varieties of violets just in that preserve. So yeah, lots around here. And it looks like Teresa just commented that she has a Newcomb's Wildflower yes. Guide and she was wondering about the violets too there. Um, uh, she said, it seems like there might not uh, be some of the invasive violets in that guide and that uh, she's found it hard to be sure of an ID on them. Uh, do we have any violet ID recommendations? Somewhere in my feed, I have somebody who put an ID on one of my violets and um, said that, oh, um, I can't really tell you down to species because you haven't photographed the right things. And so I said, well, what might those be? And they wrote back, well, you know, photograph the back side, photograph the front side, photograph the bottom side, photograph the leaves, photograph the underside of the leaves. Make sure you get a spur if there is a spur. You know, um, do one down the throat, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I figured an answer like that qualifies him as at least violet savvy, if not an expert. So um, sometimes what you can do is going into iNaturalist, look for people who have um, identified a lot of whatever it is you're looking for. Um, and uh, I don't know if folks know how to do that, but um, Jade, when you've um, finished your, unless you'd like me to grab it and do it. Um, pardon, grab the... Oh, grab. <laughs> yeah, it's the it, you know, you don't know what the it <laughs> is. <laughs> I was thinking about um, going to the sort of the home page, the species page for... Um, any species and look over in the right to see who has done the most identification and the most observation. Yeah, I, I can pull that up real quick. Um, we might have to. Yeah, walk in fact, me if we do one of these. Yeah, so actually, from right here, click on any one of these. Okay. 
um, in fact, even better, exit that and go back a, a, a page here. So this is this is what we want. So this is the home page for um, the wild pansy. And over on the right here, we see um, sea kangaroo is the top observer with 12, but TSN is the top identifier. You'll see him in a lot of places. He is really active. He is scary active. Yes, identifications 255,850. I'm not quite sure how that's humanly possible, but he's obviously managed to do it. Um, so he's uh, he's a really great person to ping, obviously with a, you know, would you mind having a look at this kind of thing? Because a lot of these folks who get identified as being a, a big identifier, or a big observer, lots of people want to ask them their opinions and so forth. So it's sort of INAT courtesy to, uh, to approach somewhat um, uh, humbly, I guess would be the word, um, and, uh, and ask if they don't mind lending you a, a bit of a hand. So that is a great um, example of how this whole website and app really works uh, from a community science perspective and building rapport among people. Um, I saw that uh, we had a link out here of a cool fuzzy plant okay, with leaves still... in rosette. Okay, you're still sharing um, Tom's page? I'm going okay. to go ahead and paste the link in here. Um, just as one last thought about those, the people pages in there, one of the reasons why it's really nice for everybody else if you fill out a little bit of your bio is that people can then tell you know you're an expert in what you're doing like you know what you're talking about or you know you're a, an enthusiastic amateur and they know how to interpret what you say because you know we all make mistakes um and we all want to learn so that can be really helpful tom obviously was somebody who could be relied on Okay, that took me just a minute, but we have it here. Okay, here's our, our um, uh, mystery plant. I love that username. <laughs> I've seen that before. I think that's absolutely great, Protopian Pickle Jar. <coughs> um, so, shall we go down a little bit? There we go, so we've got a suggestion for sub-tribe, and I have to say, I don't know how to pronounce it, Conizine, Conizine, um, as a member of the asters. Oh my, and there are so many asters. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are. So, if we view more photographs, we might get down to the leaves. Somebody who's done a there we go. Wow. So <laughs> all right, these these are by um probably by most recently added. That's I think the default um sort. So we would need to find what is local. Yes, so if we go up to the top, um, there are drop downs and sex phonology order by favorites. Uh, okay, um, just under the search bar, there's filter by place. There we go. And yep, and it should come up with, yep, there we go, the top one. Okay. So we get a sense of what we have. I think those are horse weeds. That looks a little promising. The, it does. Um, Not as fuzzy, but the shape looks pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Wonder, there is some fuzz on it. Yes, there is. Okay. All right, 
that looks as though that's the um, the sum total of what we have. So um, if we go back up to the top and we do a back to the observation, Okay, good. Then we, yep, that's that's good. We can do that. Okay. All right. So we've got the the wriggly edges. Um, anyone else? Uh, anyone else have an opinion on this one? Oh, I uh, Maya, Maya just commented that she believes it is a cat's ear dandelion, and we've got a plus one uh, on that identification from Jesse in the chat. Ooh, so let's, can we look at cat's, what was that, cat's ear dandelion? Cat's ear dandelion. So let's, let's look up a, a cat's ear dandelion. I don't know if you want to do a, a new tab or... That'll be very cool. I've never been involved in that. Um, okay, what you can do is click on observations or explore or there. Yep. One of the things about iNaturalist is there's usually many ways of doing things, which can be great, but it can also be somewhat... Um, Common cats here, false dandelion. Ah, okay. And we can um, subset by location again if we want to up by the filter, yep, to the left there actually, we've got a location box on this page. Yep, sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't. Okay, and giving it a moment. Okay. Mm. Bob Cal, okay. I don't know if you've seen before, Bob Cal is one of those people I really trust. He may have only done one here, one identification here, but I see him all over the place. He's, um, he's a, a, a UPer, and, uh, and he's identified a lot of stuff. Um, and he has good comments to make, too. He's a good person to follow or to tag as somebody to, um, to ask about things for. Yeah, look at that. Mm hmm Looks as though it's got the hair on the edges. There's the flower. Very asteraceae. <laughs> so much easier when we have flowers to work with, too. Cool. The leaves look pretty promising. Mm hmm So then we would, um, we could go in and, um, and, and change that observation or make that recommendation. We could. So we could click out of the photo and back or into the other one. Yep. And in fact, if we go down, it will give us an opportunity to agree there. So we can put in the identification. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yep, you do. I've gotten my, my observations mixed up. And do you recommend putting a comment in so that we can um, kind of justify our, our identification? Um, usually, yes. If it's really bog standard and you're the 75th person who's confirming it, uh, no, not so much. But, um, but otherwise, either you know, the, the source that you use to find it or um, what a lot of people do is, is especially if it's a, a plant where um, one or two characteristics specifically will distinguish it from some other species, then it's good to put that in there. So in this case, now I'm making this up, okay? So I don't know if this is true, but making this up, you might put in there, um, the leaves have significant um, hairiness on the margin, but no hairiness on the, I don't remember what the flat part is called, the, the plane of the leaf, um, and no hairiness on the back, uh, therefore, it is more likely to be cat's ear than regular dandelion, which has no hair at all. 
that kind of thing. So to try and, and differentiate between possibilities, if that's appropriate to what you're doing. If it's not, <clears throat> and you're really taking a wild guess, then I'll put in something like perhaps with a question mark, or best guess, or please help, or, <laughs> you know, anything like that to, um, you know, to say that, yeah, I've tried it. There's a lot of encouragement in this um, community for folks to try identifying because if you just sit back and don't do anything, it's kind of hard to get engaged. Um, but also to recognize that, you know, you may not have the level of expertise that you need um, to do it. And so you're recognizing, yeah, here's my stab at it, um, but I'm labeling it as somebody else, please have a look kind of thing. Right. And for those That's of a very you- very long answer, but <laughs> there it is. Just in case uh, someone missed it earlier, um, Maya posted this uh, link in the chat to a resource uh, that shows all of the Michigan violet species. Mm, yes. Uh, so uh, as it was pointed out, it is a little um, jargon heavy, but if you click on each of these, uh, this is uh, uh, herbarium resource you can find individual pictures and a very detailed description. So thank you so Maya, here, for sharing that. What we don't know, for example, is remember we saw one photograph where there were purple splotches on the end of the, um, of the tongue on the bottom, and these don't have it. So we would want to look um, in the description to see if there's any discussion about the variability um, among the different plants with the flowers because that might be a differentiator between species or it might not be. It, it totally depends on the, um, on the organism. Okay. Um, I, sorry, go we on. have a question in the mm -hmm. chat window um, from uh, Bachevo. It says, uh, is it worth it to take a second picture when it blooms uh, and then link it to the original post? So this would be going back to the same plant, the same organism and, and taking follow-up photos. There's a long discussion about this in several different threads on the um, the INAT forum. If you're not familiar with the forum, it's the discussion area um, where folks talk a lot about INAT. INAT. It's not for identification purposes. That's what this is for. Um, but but the INAT forum um, will uh, is a great place to go and ask. And um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion and a couple of different ways suggested. The quick answer is, yes, it's absolutely worth it because the more we can um, have uh, a library of photos of plants where it's the same plant, we know that you know this photo, this um, flower really does belong to this set of leaves, really does belong to this set of uh, seeds because the same person has gone and found the same plant and uh, um, you know photographed it over time you can tie them together with tag. There, let me say, there's no really good way. Um, no way has been designed into INAT to do this, but you can tie them together with um, tags. Uh, there were, there's a way that somebody suggested for taking the observation identifier number. I think it was tag field. It's been a while since I looked at this. Um, but if you go and you search on um, linking observations uh, or words like that in the um, in the forum, you should come up with quite a bit and uh, and look through that. In theory, grand idea. Uh, it's just. That I would be interested in because it's an interesting picture and conundrum. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. Um, let's see. And I think that's working. Can everybody see? Yes. Are you looking just at Google or at my entire screen? I think it's just at Google. We just saw the browser. Yeah. Neat. I am not very tech savvy and it gave me an option to collect 
just the browser instead of my entire screen and I selected it and it's actually functioning, which is very exciting. <laughs> so I have brought up the common dandelion. Somebody has taken this picture and suggested it. Depending on what sort of view you're using as you're going through iNaturalist and looking for things that need identification, um, oh, this is research grade. I did not see that when I clicked on it. So, but I had been looking for things that were not research grade, but somehow I ended up here anyways. But I look at this picture and I say, well, I, it looks like common dandelion, but I feel as though I can't be sure based on the characteristics given. Um, the view that I was using was the grid view. And I just happened to click on the picture just because I felt it was a very pretty picture and I wanted to look at it closer, honestly. And uh, actually you'll find that some pictures have multiple photographs associated with one observation. So this person took this very artistic, beautiful close-up picture of the reproductive organs of this flower, and then also took a more broad view of the organism from further back and all of the different rays and individual flowers associated. And, um, and so now I feel confident. I say, oh, I think this is a dandelion also. So that's something that I might also say, oh, I think this is a dandelion. We saw earlier the cat's ear dandelion, which is very similar looking in leaf morphology, but slightly different in that it is hairy. Uh, the thing that helped me tell the difference was the hairiness, of course. You can eat dandelion greens, and so having consumed dandelion greens before, I know that they're not hairy, so I knew that that, that was cat's ear dandelion and not the common dandelion. Um, but as you can see, there were a lot of similarities. So I think the thing that is most helpful when identifying plants is to get reproductive structure. If it is available, it's not always available. So flowers or um, somebody took a picture of a sensitive fern reproductive structure, which is super diagnostic. You don't even need the leaf if you have the reproductive structure because you can tell right away. Um, and so I thought that was really quite a clever use. Um, so the, the flower, the reproductive structure, and also the leaves, if you can get them, are very handy on herbaceous plants that don't have woody sticks or stems or anything like that. And if it's woody, if you can get a photograph of um, the bark can be really helpful. And so as many of these diagnostic features as possible, the more of them that you can get, the more confident you can be in your identification. Something else that I think could be really handy, so for example, that cat's ear dandelion we took a look at, if we were looking at it and we said, oh, we think that's common dandelion, and we suggested that identification and other people agreed with us, we could go back later and take a photo of the flower and post it again if we know it's that same individual saying common dandelion? And the community can help us say, oh, no, no, that's actually cat's ear dandelion. And so we can back reference our own observations, especially if it's a particular individual that we are confident that we know it's the same one. Um, so those can be really helpful things as well to help you identify, particularly if you're on iNaturalist a lot, like many of us probably are, and you know it's the same individual and you've identified it before. And yes, I think that can all be very handy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I discovered that there's also a red something dandelion in this area. And I was, when I was doing the, um, the research for it, I didn't see any comparison of the flowers, but um, it showed the leaves and the leaves would take one of two forms. Either they would be triangular on each side with a long base against the stem and they'd be nicely lined up opposite each other or else um, they'd be sort of higgledy piggledy. So not terribly well-defined triangles, not very well lined up. Um, and that was the common one. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, um, uh, that would be another reason to try and get both the flowers and the leaves, especially for these, um, uh, these wildflowers, which dandelions are, even though they grow in the lawn. <laughs> I actually have one that I'd like to uh, share because it's, um, it's puzzled me a fair bit. Um, if I can grab the screen. Okay, 
So this thing, the thing that I'm trying to identify is this thing in the capsule in the middle. Yeah, now, speaking of not giving you a lot to go on, um, right next to it are some spring beauties. So that much I do know. And underneath it, obviously, is some moss. I originally looked at this, and I sort of took a flight of fancy and said, maybe it's a crocus. And somebody came back and said, no, it's not a crocus. And they took it up to angiosperm which was like as, about as high as you can get, you know. Um, and then I looked at this and realized, well, doy, if you ha have moss growing on something, it's, you know, well, actually, as it happens, I know it was growing on a rock. So there's nowhere there for a, a crocus bulb to, to live. So it couldn't possibly be a crocus. So that kind of took us back to square one. So um, it's not a, a, a spring beauty. I know it's not a bloodwort, and it's not a mayapple, just sort of the three big things that I would think about in that area that, that come up with some kind of a, a capsule or, or enclosed form like that. So what we can do, although if I remember correctly, this was singularly unhelpful, um, we can go down and we can say suggest an identification. And if we're lucky, we'll get something that's relatively close. Sometimes iNaturalist takes leave of its senses and it gives you responses like, you know, giraffe, tiger, leopard, cardinal, when you're trying to identify a bird um, or a, a plant rather. And uh, yeah, so actually- That's, that, that's <laughs> That's because it, it uses a combination, it uses more of, of the geographic location. It's a combination of geographic location um, and things that are around it, as well as some sort of features. And so uh, it, it really depends on, and also depends on how many uh, examples of it there are and where it is. So if it's a, a place that has had a lot of observations, that means a better training data set for it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it, a lot of things go into those suggestions, but they're getting better. Uh, oh yeah, with more observations. And most of the time, some of the time, they're absolutely astonishing. But I have to say, it's been a long time since I saw lions or tigers or leopards. Oh my, in Michigan. <laughs> but that's that's good to know. Yes, you're right. Um, so now it's so it's telling. He didn't tell me this before. Last time at the top um, was crocus. But to your point, Justin. Um, if lots of people have been out there and have been observing small white leaks, it may be that it's got a lot more to compare to. And so it thinks that um, this could be a small white leak. And in fact, not only is it visually similar, but it's been seen nearby. So I'm actually willing, I'm, I'm happy to take a, take a flyer on this one. So I'm going to put INAT suggestion in that one. And my guess is that will probably get confirmed. I didn't, if I'd thought that it might be a leak, um, I could have very naughtily um, just broken the tip off or, or made a little um, cut in the side and sniffed it. And um, this should have smelled like onions. And if, it, if I had done that, and it did, that would have been a nice confirmation. But I get so wrapped up in the photographing when I'm out there that I don't think about things like that. So, okay. You know, um, Kit, that photo you showed uh, is a really nice segue into something that I noticed when I was going through that list of observations that still need to be identified. Um, yeah, go for it. And Kit was um, kind enough to put together a uh, a list, and I'm going to post it in the chat window, of things that were found in our area that still need identifying um, for the City Nature Challenge. Uh, and while I was in that, um, list, I came across a really interesting photograph. I'm, um, Do you want to take uh, control? I'm going to. Okay. I will yeah, that'd be great. go for it. 
here. I'll stop share. That should make Relinquish it easier. Control. It should let you just take it. I set that toggle, but you know. Okay. Good. Everybody see the moss that's being shown here? Yes, there it's up. So this is uh so this is a really interesting um conundrum that frequently happens in communities of um mosses because as I'm sure many of you have noticed, moss to grow kind of um, in and among other uh, plants, other moss, other fungi. Um, and if you look at this photograph kind of just on the screen as I had initially looked at it, it does seem like uh, the person who uh, suggested an ID for this is, is on the right path. Um, but when we zoom in really closely, uh, what I'm observing here isn't actually a moss at all. Um, no. there, is, there is moss among it, um, mm -hmm. but this, this is, is actually a lichen mm -hmm. that's growing on top of the moss. And um, this happens often. So when you're taking uh, pictures, it, it's, it, it can be really important to kind of pin down uh, which particular organism you're looking at. Um, as you may know, lichens are a symbiotic organism, or at least um, that is kind of the, the running definition between uh -huh. a, a fungus, a green algae, or cyanobacteria, and most recently discovered uh, a yeast partner as well. Really? So these little um, these little bits of uh, that look like what would be the leaf of the moss are actually called squamules. Uh, that is one of the main uh, growth forms or uh, body shapes, phallus shapes as they're called, uh, of lichens. And uh, one of the genera that's most common in these kind of uh, mossy, damp environments uh, is the genus Cladonia. It uh, is the same genus, uh, if you're familiar with the British soldiers, uh, they're the, the lichens that uh, have the little red cap on the top. Uh, that's actually a reproductive structure. Um, so Cladonia is one of the most common genera uh, that have these squamule uh, growth forms. And if you look, uh, I just pulled some pictures up um, online so you can get a better idea of what those were to look like if you were to observe them with, say, a hand lens or, um, oops, a we have a, okay, page did not want to load. So <laughs> I see we got something in the chat window. Oh, great. Alan so, oh, wow. That's just a little. So here you can really see in this picture on the, on the right here what those squamules look like close up. So, the thing about lichens is oftentimes you can't actually identify them to the species level without doing a, um, a chemical test. So uh, lichenologists refer to these as spot tests. And there are various common chemicals, um, bleach being one of them, um, potassium hydroxide being another, that react with the unique secondary metabolites or chemicals that are generated in the lichen thallus. Um, so uh, some species, uh, like many of the crustose lichens, the one that looks like spray paint on a tree, um, many of those can only be identified by actually cutting their reproductive parts in cross-section and looking at the algal partner under a microscope. So field identification of lichens can be really tricky, <laughs> um, but the moral of the story is uh, when photographing moss, double check because it might be a lichen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, it's one of the re one of the many reasons I tend to take camera photographs and then take them back and Photoshop them because 
I clip out a little piece that really focuses in on what I want to. Now here, obviously, um, I didn't do a very good job with the leak one. I should have at least put a note in there saying, I'm looking for identification of that, that thing that's sticking up in the middle of the picture, you know, the rounder one, um, because there are three different species there. Uh, so do keep a, a mind, something that's absolutely obvious to you, uh, it's the center of the picture, how could you make a mistake or, or think anything else uh, should be identified to other people may not be. Um, so just a, a suggestion. Anybody have anything else they want to share or should we take a stab at identifying a few of those mystery items before we wrap up? I, I had something, yeah. Yeah, I have a fun yeah, one. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the screen. And this one really shows off that, um, that website that I shared earlier as well. So is everybody seeing this yes. observation? Oh, yes. Is, this is a really fun one. Okay, so I look at this plant. I was scrolling through the ones that need IDs. I saw this. I know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a really great example of using multiple sources to help you narrow down what something is based on only one feature. So this identification has only these leaves in it. So there's no reproductive structures. And I'm gonna talk more about this in a minute, but sometimes leaf shape changes throughout the life cycle of a plant. So we have only these leaves to go off of right now. And in the comment section, we can see one person suggested the subfamily Hydrophilium. Um, I can't actually see the rest of that family, but it's it's a part of the, the larger family, Aragonaceae, which I'm mildly familiar with. And so there's some commentary about one person says it looks like this particular species of hydrophilum. The other person says, I'm not very confident. And so I left it at some family level. And so we can say, okay, so they think it's this particular subfamily of this larger family. The Michigan Flora website that I mentioned for violets earlier, I will say very jargon heavy, so not going to be really helpful to everyone, but still a very cool website, has lots of different photographs of Michigan wildflowers at various stages of their life cycle, also has a key, so we can go through here and we can look at the key for the family Baraginaceae and say, oh, it has these particular different um, characteristics. So we're looking at the hydrophilum subfamily, and there's only three species. And so we're saying, okay, we're feeling pretty confident at this point that it's gonna be one of these three species. Um, App Garm commented that he thinks it's hydrophilum appendiculatum. So if we go over here and we say, okay, hydrophilum appendiculatum, they show primarily the reproductive structure because it's the easiest thing to identify any plant from. But we can say, let's look at all of the images and see what all of the images look like. And as we're looking at these, I'm not seeing any leaves. So these are the adult leaves on these guys. To me, they do not look like this. So I feel that this is probably not Hydrophilum appendiculatum. So we're going to go Although, back. Um, I Maya, when you look at that, you can see why um, one person made the comment, it's hard to separate them from Phacelia because those flowers are perfect yeah. Phacelia flowers. Yeah, right? So again, it's like one of those, you have to look at multiple mm -hmm. different features if you can. Granted, it is what is available to you. Um, and this early in the year. So I think this is Hydrophyllum virginianum. And to me, this flower looks a little bit like nodding wild onion, but we don't have a flower to go off of anyways. We only have leaves. If we look at the adult leaves, it sort of looks similar, but there's no variegation in it. There's none of that white color, right? So we want to go back. Maybe in here, there are some photos of the juvenile leaves. And sure enough, mm -hmm. if we float down a little bit further, we see some of these juvenile leaves. They have that variegation. Um, these like deeply lobed leaflets on them. And if we say, oh, yes, it looks a lot like this. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think this is Hydrophyllum virginianum. Mm -hmm. uh, but just for fun, let's take a look at the third species, Hydrophyllum canadense. So we can see the young leaves here. 
similar in shape, similar in that variegation, right? Uh -huh. Spring leaves. So if you guys were looking and you saw a hydrophyllum canadense in this photograph, right? So it's mildly hairy. They've got rounded leaf tips to them. That hydrophyllum canadense looks quite similar. And if we go back to the hydrophyllum virginianum and look again, so there's a lot of back and forth comparison. I actually think that this is hydrophyllum canadense based on these leaves to me look sharper. So we're looking at whether the teeth of the leaves are sharp or round on the end. And so if we're looking at this, these are much rounder. So my final decision on this, if I'm suggesting an identification, is that I think that this is hydrophyllum canadense. So we'll go back and we'll look at that picture one more time before I put in my suggested ID. And I can't quite zoom in on this. Let's see, maybe I can. No, I can't get this picture to blow up larger. But if you look at these lobes, you can see that they are rounded. Um, so this is just an example of how I use the University of Michigan's Herbarium Michigan Floral website. I find it incredibly helpful. They often have all of these different pictures of the various life stages of this plant. So this is again, one where if somebody knows exactly where this particular individual is, they can come out and take a photograph at it later on and the flower will tell you absolutely which species this is because the three different species have very different flowers. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and suggest hydrophyllum canadense. Whoops, there's another A in there. I'm going to say that I think it is this. So all of that to say I think Michigan Flora is a really handy tool. I really enjoy the community feature of the iNaturalist website because, again, it can really help you narrow that down. Um, and that was just an example of how I personally go through and look at the identification of a particular thing down to a species level. Good teamwork. Teresa just said that was actually her observation that you pulled out there. Oh, <laughs> I'm really excited to hear that. <clears throat> and just to be clear, the University of Michigan Herbarium is a free resource. It's available to anyone. Uh, you don't have to uh, be a student or work at the University of Michigan. Um, so please go forth and explore that. Yeah, I love it. I find it very useful, um, <clears throat> but I find it most useful when I have some idea of what it is I'm looking for. So it's, um, I've, I have, I'm terrible with keys. So I have a lot more trouble with, um, you know, I've got this uh, flower, it kind of looks like this, it has this color, so on and so forth. I find the herbarium not so useful for that, but once I have a sense of at least a family, it's awesome. And as you say, the, the photographs are, are a wonderful resource and it's from here. <laughs> so you're not going to get caught out making an identification of something from South Africa um, <clears throat> when in fact you were photographing in Michigan. <clears throat> oh, and one more thing I'd like to add really quickly. So when I first looked at that picture, I felt really confident it was Virginia water leaf and not mm -hmm. the, the Canada water leaf or the broad water leaf. Um, so this is just an, another example of like closely related species that look really similar and have very mild differences. So it's always good, even if you feel pretty good about it, like I felt pretty good about that going in, that it was Virginia. It never hurts to just double check and make sure that those key um, small features, those details are in place. So those round tooths on those leaves instead of those pointy tooths. Mm -hmm. So we're at two past the hour. Um, I don't know if we want to call it an evening or go on with a few more. Um, your call, Jade. My call. I was, uh, see how everyone is um, feeling here. Um, I'm gonna do a bit of Anyone shameless self- to share one less off? So I'm gonna do a shameless bit of shameless self-promotion. Self yes, that's not an <laughs> observation, but um, one of the how I got to know a lot more about uh, 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 INAT is as part of a podcast I produce 
and we did an episode that has an interview with both um, Carrie Seltzer, who works at, at INET, as well mm -hmm. as a nonprofit in the Northeast that uses INET as part of a phonology project. So I'm going to post a link to that episode. You can also find it under the name Citizen Science. Uh, it's, it's produced with SciStarter, a big uh, citizen science project aggregator. Mm -hmm. But that particular episode is about INAT, um, its history and how people are using it, and some more details on computer vision stuff and how the um, sort of correction, uh, reconciliation process works and all of that, that sort of greater detail. So give it a listen, you know, share it if you like it, all those good things that you do with podcasts. <laughs> cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Yeah, it's an amazing tool. Okay, well, uh, it looks like some folks are getting ready to step out for dinner, so um, maybe we can call it a night. Really appreciate everybody coming out and uh, sharing what they saw during the City Nature Challenge. Um, and for the folks at home who are going to be watching this uh, a little bit later, uh, do keep in mind that uh, iNaturalist is not just for the City Nature Challenge. You can use the app anytime, anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's free to use. So go ahead and uh, get yourself involved in the iNat community. And thank you, Jade thank you. and Kit for and Maya for organizing all of this. Mm -hmm. It's been a blast. And thank you for the technical support, Justin. I intend to take full advantage of it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <Not the>, yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone. Okay, Have a fantastic all evening. Right. Yes, and take thanks care. so much for your participation. Okay. Bye bye. Bye y'all. Bye everyone. <laughs>